All right, folks, welcome back. This is going to be the B cell activation, which we touched on briefly, but we haven't really talked in detail about it. And this is a long one because we have to talk about antibodies because that's what B cells make are antibodies. All right, so first of all, what you see here is the sensitization step, and that is telling the B cell to make antibodies. And how that happens is foreign antigens bind these antibodies sticking off of the B cell. Now these antibodies sticking off the B cell happen to be a type of antibody called IgD. I'm going to get to the different types of antibodies shortly, and I might, might as well just tell you right now, it's IgG, A, M, E, and D. So IgG, IgA, IgM, IgE, and IgD. The sensitization of the B cells occurs when foreign antigens bind those antibodies. Now, notice something else. Notice that a foreign antigen also bound to a class 2 MHC molecule. Because remember who can recognize class 2 MHC molecules? T helper cells can recognize class 2 MHC molecules. So the foreign antigen binds these IgD antibodies and binds an MHC class 2 molecule. The activation is when a T helper cell, how do I know this is a T helper cell? It just says T cell. Well, I know it's a T helper cell because this is a class 2 MHC. CD4 T helpers recognize class 2 MHCs. So when that binds, when the T helper cell binds to that class 2 MHC on the B cell, we get cytokines co-stimulation. Interleukins are secreted. And the interleukins are cytokines that activate these cells. So that's what's going on here. It's the activation. The activated B cells differentiate into plasma cells. You can see that word right here, plasma cell. And it's actually the plasma cells that are making the antibodies. Why are they drawing this cell with all that crap inside it? Well, because it's rough ER. Because antibodies are proteins and rough ER makes proteins. So these plasma cells have just a ton of rough ER. And they just go, they're just little protein producing machines now. And they make antibodies. Don't forget that not only do you have plasma cells that make antibodies, but you also have a pool of memory B cells, which the next time they're, they, they see that foreign antigen, they become plasma cells quicker and they make even more antibodies. So this is the clonal expansion. By the way, it says division and differentiation. Yeah, I agree. It's division and differentiation. But we call this clonal expansion because it's a clone of B cells now, clonal expansion. And this is the collage showing you sensitization, activation, and clonal expansion. The immune system can produce antibodies against millions of different antigens. B cells, which are constantly produced from lymphoid stem cells, are found in the blood and lymphoid tissues. Each B cell can synthesize only one of the millions of possible antibodies and displays this antibody on its surface. When an antigen meets a B cell having a surface antibody of the proper specificity, it complexes with the antibody. B cells that are not activated do not develop further. Stimulation of only the B cells that carry antibodies that react with antigen is referred to as clonal selection. Following antigen-antibody interaction, antigen-antibody complexes aggregate on the surface of the cell. This is called capping. The antigen-antibody complexes are then internalized. The activated B cell swells and begins to divide rapidly, producing a B cell clone. The B cells then differentiate into plasma cells and memory cells. Plasma cells produce the specific antibody that provoked its formation, whereas memory cells remain in circulation but do not produce antibodies.
memory cells can become activated by a later challenge by the same antigen. Many antibody responses require signals from T helper cells. The T helper cell is stimulated by an interaction with an antigen presenting cell such as a macrophage. The macrophage ingests the antigen, digests it, and presents it on the cell surface via a class 2 MHC. The macrophage then activates a T helper cell that carries a T cell receptor capable of recognizing the antigen on the class 2 MHC of the macrophage. The B cell presents the antigen on its surface using class 2 MHC. The activated T helper cell interacts with the B cell and secretes chemical signals called interleukins to stimulate the B cell to differentiate into a plasma cell and produce antibodies. Okay, that's clonal expansion and clonal selection. Monoclonal antibody preparations contain only one type of antibody derived from a single cloned B cell. Consequently, they are highly specific for a single epitope and have applications, for example, in diagnostic microbiology and cancer therapy. The first step in producing a monoclonal antibody is to inject an animal with an antigen containing the specific epitope of interest. Each B cell produces a single type of antibody. B cells are isolated from the spleen and then mixed with myeloma cells, a type of cancer cell that grows continuously. Addition of polyethylene glycol causes the two types of cells to fuse together to form cells called hybridomas. The mixture of B cells, myeloma cells, and hybridomas are cultured under conditions which permit growth of only the hybridoma cells. Each hybridoma cell will produce a single type of antibody against a single epitope. The single hybridoma cells are then separated into individual wells of a microtiter plate and tested for ability to produce the desired antibody. The hybridoma cells producing the desired monoclonal antibody are then cultured. Monoclonal antibodies are isolated and purified. Okay, that's how we make the monoclonal antibodies we want. And we use that in a lot of tests. For example, I'll just give you an example. We could be injecting this mouse or rat with human chorionic gonadotropin. That's the pregnancy hormone. But it's foreign to the mouse. So what does the mouse do? It makes antibodies against HCG. Now what we do is we take a human cancer cell this is a mouse B cell, but we take a human cancer cell and we treat it so that it fuses into a hybridoma. And he told you, but you don't have to know that. The polyethylene glycol is what aids in that fusion. But this is a human cancer cell and a murine or mouse B cell, and they fuse into a hybridoma. And what it does is now it makes antibodies to the human chorionic gonadotropin, and we have it in this test tube. And now we can use it in a pregnancy test, one of those strips you buy from the store. That's just one example of many, many applications of monoclonal antibodies. This is what an antibody looks like. It looks like a Y, so we usually draw it as a Y. It does have a, uh, two heavy chains and two light chains. And the light chains are either kappa or lambda. And if, if one side's kappa, the other side's kappa. So if this is kappa, then this is kappa. Whereas if this is lambda, then this has to be lambda. You can't have a mix of kappa and lambda. And then the heavy chains come in five different types. There's G, A, M, E, D. Therefore, we call the five different types of antibodies immunoglobulin G, IgG, immunoglobulin A, IgA, immunoglobulin M, immunoglobulin E, and immunoglobulin D. And it has to do with what type of heavy chain it has. Now look at the end of the antibody out here. This is called the variable or sometimes the hypervariable region. And actually you can see the variable region right there. It's, let me erase some of these red lines. So you can see that they're calling this the variable segment. So you can change the rest of this antibody, but you're not changing that. 
because it's this variable segment that contains the information to bind the antigen. And I will tell you that even amongst the variable segments, much of it is constant except for this very end called the hypervariable region. So we have this variable region that has the antigen binding site. Now, we can make millions of different types of antibodies, but we don't have millions of genes. And the answer is, we don't need millions of genes. We can keep a lot of this the same. We can keep a lot of the heavy chain the same, except for the variable region. We can keep a lot of the light chain the same, except for the variable region. So we can reuse these constant regions genetically. We have genes for the constant regions that can be reused for different types of antibodies. But what you only thing you have to change is the hypervariable region. Okay, so that's a gen, that's a basic antibody structure. This is a, a computerized image of it. Human cells do not have enough DNA to have separate genes for each antibody molecule. Instead, different segments of DNA can be mixed and matched to form different antibodies. Light chains are made from V and J segments in the variable region and a constant region segment, whereas heavy chains are made from V, D, and J segments in the variable region and one of five different constant region segments. As the lymphocyte divides during maturation, its genes are rearranged. DNA sequences are assembled by the random selection of V and J gene segments for the light chains and V, D, and J segments for the heavy chains. The constant region of the molecule is encoded by a single C or constant gene segment for light chains and five different constant regions for heavy chains. The rearranged DNA in the mature B cell is transcribed into messenger RNA and translated into the light chains of the antibody. DNA sequences for the variable regions of each heavy chain are assembled by the random selection of a V gene segment a D gene segment and a J gene segment. The genes for the constant regions of heavy H chains have Greek letters designating IgG gamma, IgM mu, IgA alpha, IgE epsilon and IgD delta. The DNA in the mature B cell is transcribed and translated into the heavy chain protein. The light chains are then attached to the heavy chains to form the functional antibody. Because of the large number of ways in which the genes can be rearranged, many different antibodies can be produced. Okay, so you can see the gene shuffling that goes on to make the different types of antibodies. You, and you can see that just in the light chain alone, you have 300 variable genes and you have, let's just say that this is accurate here, five joining genes. So that means that you, you do the combination of all five of these with all 300 of these. And that's the number of variable regions you can get there with one constant region. And by the way, that's for just one of the, uh, either the kappa or the lambda light, light chain. There's other chains as well. In addition, on the heavy chain, you have over a hundred variable genes. You have some D genes and some joining genes. J stands for joining. And then you have your five heavy chain constant regions, gamma, uh, G-A-M-E-D. And the, the Greek letters go with the Arabic letters. Uh, I mean, the, uh, yeah, the Arabic letters. So, uh, you like mu, uh, mu is M, gamma is G, D is delta, epsilon is E, and alpha is A. So there you go there. So this is gene shuffling. That's how we get our, our antibody diversity. Now, this whole, uh, what color is this to you guys? Probably yellow. Uh, actually, the epitopes are yellow. This is what, tan? Is that tan? All right, let's just say it's tan or beige. I guess it's, I don't know. You guys are going to yell at me or be laughing at me. And then that's this whole tan thing is an antigen. It's a, say it's a foreign antigen. On that foreign antigen, there's different mounds and crevices, different shapes sticking off of it. And these are called epitopes. And there's different epitopes on this one antigen. And they can be different shapes. So in other words, you don't make just one kind of antibody to one antigen. 
you can make several different kinds of antibodies to one antigen because the antibody recognizes these epitopes or antigenic determining sites. That's what the antibody recognizes. So let's just pretend that all these antibodies are recognizing different shape epitopes. I have one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different types of antibodies against this one antigen. So this one antigen could be Streptococcus pyogenes, the strep throat bacteria. And I just made eight different types of antibodies against one antigen on Streptococcus pyogenes. But each one of these antibodies recognizes a different epitope or antigenic determinant site. So all eight of these mixed together are called polyclonal antibodies because they're not the same. They come from more than one clone. But if you only took seven, seven only, would be a monoclonal antibody. But if you mix seven with eight, now you're polyclonal. But if you only have all of the sevens, all of the antibodies against seven epitope, that's a monoclonal population. And this is what we have. We have antigens that have different epitopes or antigenic determinant sites on them. And we make antibodies to those antigenic determinant sites. However, sometimes the antigenic determinant site isn't interesting enough to elicit an immune response. It's too small, maybe not uh, curvaceous enough, meaning it doesn't have enough ridges and valleys. And if, if the antigenic determinant site doesn't elicit an immune response all by itself, we call it a haptin. The haptin by itself is too small, too uninteresting for our immune system to mount an immune response to it and build antibodies. However, if that haptin binds with another molecule that's larger and together they make this antigenic, then I can build antibodies against it. If you do have an antigen that all by itself has is large enough and interesting enough to elicit an immune response, it's a complete antigen. But you have these incomplete antigens where the haptin doesn't elicit an immune response and it must bind to a carrier molecule for it to elicit an immune response. So the haptins are often called partial antigens. All right. Now, here's the problem. Here's the danger. This haptin could be a drug you take. And the drug by itself is no problem. It could be penicillin. No problem. You won't build an antibody against penicillin because it's a haptin. But what if the penicillin adheres, adsorbs, not, not absorb, not taken up, but adsorbs, sticks to a platelet or a red blood cell? Well, suddenly that haptin is now being carried by a large, larger carrier entity, and our body recognizes it as foreign and we attack it. And do we lice our own platelet or lice our own red blood cell? You bet. That's exactly what we do. So sometimes drugs are haptins and they lead to lysis of our own cells. So you got to remember that. And by the way, when the drug is the haptin and it leads to lysis of our own cells, it can be called drug-induced autoimmune hemolytic anemia. If, they, if you're lysing a, lysing a red blood cell, it's hemolytic anemia. It could be drug-induced autoimmune thrombocytopenia, thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura. <laughs> I don't even know if I did that one right. Anyway, you can have these hemolytic anemias that are drug-induced. It means there's nothing wrong with your red blood cells except for penicillin stuck to them and now you're killing them or a platelet thrombocytopenia purpura the that's what the tp stands for thrombocytopenia means low platelets purpura means you get purple blotches on your skin because you're bleeding because you don't have any platelets why don't you have any platelets because you're attacking them so if the haptin if the drug binds the platelets and you destroy all your platelets then you're going to have clotting issues so this can happen this drug induced autoimmune stuff
Antigens are macromolecules, usually of molecular weight greater than 10,000, such as proteins and polysaccharides. They are recognized by the immune system as foreign. Individual antibodies are not made against the entire antigen molecule, but rather to particular chemical groups on the molecules known as antigenic determinants or epitopes. Many different antibodies can be made against a single antigen, each antibody reacting with a different epitope. Complex structures, such as the surfaces of bacterial cells, may have many different epitopes. Each different antibody binds only to the correct epitope. Okay, that's showing you antibodies binding to their specific epitope. Now, here are the five classes of antibodies. IgG, this is the most abundant in the plasma. It's not the most abundant in the body, though. And the reason is because IgA is on mucous membranes, and there's more IgA in your entire body than there is anything. But IgG is the most abundant uh, in the plasma. Okay, it's the most abundant in the plasma. And when it says the largest and most diverse class, it doesn't mean that this individual antibody is the largest. It means it accounts for 80% of all of your antibodies. It's the 80% that's why it says it's the largest. It's not because of size. Because, in fact, when you see an IgM, you're going to see how big it is. All right, so that's IgG, most abundant in the plasma or the blood. IgE sticks off of mast cells. So think mast cell. I'm looking for it down here. Um, mast cells. And when an allergen binds to it, it causes the mast cell to degranulate, release its histamine. And the histamine leads to the uh, inf inflammation you get and the, your, uh, your allergy. Your runny nose, that's inflammation, that's an allergy. So this is the allergen or the antigen. The antigen for IgEs are often called allergens. They're still antigens, they're just called allergens because they cause what we call an allergic response, which is really just an inflammation response. That's really what it is. IgD sticks off of of B cells. We've already talked about that. They stick off of B cells. They stick off from this end. So if here's the B cell with a nucleus in it, and here's the here's the IgD, see the IgD is sticking off from this end here. It's not the the business end that attacks. It's the FC portion we call it. And I won't go into why they call it FC. It doesn't matter. This is IgM. It's a big pentamer. That means there's five of these antibodies. There's one, two, three, four, five. There's five of these antibodies. Bodies. It's a pentameric pentamer. Five. And this is the first antibody to respond when you have an infection. But it's not made in great. Well, actually, it, yeah, it's the first one to respond in the primary response. It's the first one to respond in the primary response, but it's not the most abundant in the uh, in the blood. Uh, but it does tell us a lot because it's the first to respond in a primary response. It's too big to cross the placenta, so this doesn't cross the placenta and therefore is not involved in hurting the baby if, if hemolytic disease of the newborn occurs. It's not an IgM. It has to be an IgG because IgG crosses the placenta. And back here it says that someplace. It says, can cross the placenta. Whereas, IgM, I actually don't know if it says it. It doesn't say it can't cross the placenta, but typically it can't cross the placenta. And then IgA is really interesting. First of all, it's found on mucous membranes. So it's found on mucous membranes. Therefore, it's the most abundant antibody in your body, but not in the blood. All right. It doesn't circulate in the blood to that significant amount. But someplace else it's found. Mom's milk. It doesn't even say that here. Huh. Mucus, tears, saliva, semen. Yeah, but it doesn't say milk. Mom's milk. That's what I want you to know. It's found, IgA is found in mom's milk. So the baby gets IgA from the mom. Uh, 
it's it's resistant to stomach acid digestion just so you know that's resistant to that so when the baby drinks mom's milk it gets iga it doesn't it's not digested in the stomach so it can get into the baby and you can see the iga is a dimer i almost forgot to tell you that it's a dimer here's one and here's two antibodies hooked at their fc portion all right that's iga remember mom's milk all right antibodies don't directly kill anything but they do neutralize or precipitate or activate complement, as you know, because the classical complement pathway was activated by antibodies. They can opsonize, uh, and that means coat something for destruction. That's what opsonization means. They can be a chemoattractant to phagocytes, so they're attracted to phagocytes. Uh, they can help with, uh, they can in stimulate inflammation. Of course they can. I already told you IgE causes mast cell degranulation. So, of course, they do. They stimulate inflammation. IgE does that. And they can prevent the bacteria from adhering to certain membranes and getting into our body. Because when our antibody is opsonized, that the bacteria is not so good at traversing membranes anymore because they're all coated with an antibody. So they have these functions, but they don't directly kill anything. But they indirectly do. I mean, complement kills. If the antibody activates complement, complement kills. It makes big whole membrane attack complexes. If you, if you attract a phagocyte to the area, that kills. If you opsonize and increase phagocytic efficiency, that kills. So you can see that even though antibodies don't directly kill anything, they do a lot to help us kill foreign, foreign antigens, foreign cells. The first time you're exposed to an antigen, it's called the primary response. Pretty slow. Look at, you're not even peaking. Your, your antibody is not even peaking for about two weeks. Your IgM is the first one to go up, but it doesn't go up very high. After about a week and a half, it peaks, and then it, uh, it, it uh, wanes. So it peaks and then wanes. Your IgG is your second antibody to be made. It delays behind the IgM, and it peaks in about two weeks, and then it wanes. So your primary response is really not that great. But you made memory cells. And the second time that you're exposed to that antigen, look how fast you go up. First of all, both IgM and IgG go up before one week. Before one week even goes by, you have a significant amount of antibodies. Before, it took you two weeks to get, and by the way, I wish I had y-axis numbers I could show you. I don't have y-axis numbers. But you can see that this is a pretty weak response compared to this one. So in your secondary response, first you make IgG. You make IgG first. What about your primary response? IgM is first. Primary response, initially you make IgM. Secondary response, you initially make IgG. Primary response, you get more IgG, but it lags behind IgM. Secondary response, you get more IgG, and it's in front of IgM. It doesn't lag behind, and you make so much more of it. Look how high that peak is in your secondary response. Remember, the secondary response is sometimes called the anamnestic response, and this is the whole basis for vaccination. And this is a collage showing you both graphs together, the primary and secondary response. All right, this is a collage here showing you the combined immune response. So it's everything you've learned so far. It's the innate nonspecific immunity, complement and other proteins like defensins, natural killer cells and macrophages. They go down, they destroy foreign things. Meanwhile, in the adaptive arm of your immunity, you have cell-mediated immunity. T killers kill. T cytotoxics kill. I should say T cytotoxics. You make memories, so the next time you're exposed, you're better. In the humoral immunity part, the antibody-mediated immunity, B cells activate into plasma cells, and they make antibodies. Now, antibodies don't directly kill, but they can indirectly kill. Antibodies can indirectly kill. You do make some memory T helpers and you make some memory B cells. So this is the combined response that you see here. And this is a graph that shows you what's going on with an infection. You can see your neutrophils going up, your natural killers going up. You can see your T cytotoxics going up. You can see your plasma cells going up. I mean, you just have all kinds of uh, things going on here to fight off infection. 
So it's not one uh, one branch or the other. It's all of our branches acting together. Look at how the antibody level, the brown line, lags behind the plasma cells. Well, that makes sense. Your plasma cells peaked and are now making antibodies, then your antibodies peak shortly thereafter. So you can see that there. This is showing you uh, how you fight off bacteria. You can see that you're going to make a, you're going to opsonize and phagocytosize. You're going to make antibodies against them. Some T cytotoxic cells are going to kill them directly. This is showing you fight, fighting off viruses. Typically, well, it's not typical actually. With viruses, back here with bacteria, you didn't have a lot of natural killers involved. But with viruses, you can have a significant natural killer involvement there with T cytotoxics and B cells making antibodies. This is showing you a collage. All right, so these summary tables tell you what's going on with which cell when. Remember the mast cells and basophils is IgE. Just remember that. That's IgE. The antigen is called an allergen. Remember the macrophages are called antigen presenting cells. And these are going to present with MHC class 2, which means they're going to bind a CD4 T helper. Okay, that's what they're going to bind. T cytotoxics are CD8 cells, and these are going to bind an MHC class 1. Uh, T helpers are CD4 cells. These, these are going to bind an MHC class 2. B cells are going to differentiate into plasma cells and make uh, antibodies. And, of course, we have all of our memory cells. So this is a good cell summary and what's going on there. I'll see you in the last section.